Hello, I'm Josh Rivers, the creator and host of Busy Being Black, the podcast exploring how we live in the fullness of our queer Black lives. The show is a growing compendium of queer Black voices and centers conversations with those who have learned and are learning to thrive at the intersection of their identities. Today, I'm delighted to be in conversation on the invitation of my G work with Topher Campbell and Megan Stewart. Topher Campbell is an Afro-queer artist and filmmaker, also an icon and a legend and one of my idols. And Megan Stewart is a Scottish theater and film practitioner and film producer. We're going to be, we're going to be discussing uh, Topher Campbell's new film that hasn't yet been made or released called Encounters. Um, I'm honored to be in conversation with you, Topher, every single time. I think this is probably the, the fourth time that we've had a conversation, um, you know, pr- publicly, uh, not, to, not to mention all the ones we've had privately. Um, and so thank you for um, letting me have this conversation with you and with Megan. I really, really, well, thank you to my G work for inviting us on to do this. And, and yeah, I mean, all the love goes back to you, Josh. I think what you're doing with Busy Being Black is amazing. So it's really good to be here. And yeah, having a chance to have a, another chance to have a chat. Yeah, yeah, cool. I was telling someone earlier that every time we talk, there's like a new, something else unlocks. It's yeah. like a, it's like a leveling up almost every single time. Yeah. <laughs> and you think when you did the pre-conversation was just like, yes, and yes, and yeah, I was just like, oh my God. <laughs> it's just magic, yeah. Yeah, it's a good, it's a good thing actually, because it's one of those spaces which are, we don't often, even more so now because of the COVID situation, we don't often get to enjoy. We don't often get to enjoy that kind of community, that commun- communion, if you like. Mm-hmm. And um, yeah, so it's good. And as an artist, uh, uh, working in the space which is often not even you know recognized to have somebody like yourself making busy being black and bringing these conversations to the forefront here and on instagram and other spaces and from i know you're not british in terms of your heritage but in terms of you know the or totally british but having that coming from this country is also really important as well i think well thank you <laughs> i love you too <laughs> <laughs> So I, I think let's start with a, let's start by telling the My G Work audience what Encounters is. Sure, um, Encounters. Okay, so the so basically Encounters is the film that I proposed in response to a, a commission, a call out by Visual Aids, which is a, a, an arts charity based and company based in New York, which is basically there to bring to keep the conversation about HIV and AIDS alive and at the forefront. So they do this thing called World Without Aid, World, <laughs> World Without Art on um, December the 1st, which is World AIDS Day every year. Yeah, and they've got one coming up this year. Um, and they do it in collaboration with the Whitney Museum in New York and also lots of other amazing organizations worldwide. So, and so they commission a series of artists or artist filmmakers um, of which I am one to respond personally to their experience thinking around HIV and AIDS. So Encounters is a, a film that I came up with, um, up with, an idea that I came up with because I've been meditating on, as an artist, what can I do with this subject matter? How can I, you know, there's all the political, political side, there's a medical side and science side, but there's something about wanting to, you know, being an artist, if you like, and, you know, inhabiting the space I do, that gives me a chance to say something which is creative and artistic, but it opens up a conversation in a different way, which isn't just about policy and um, you know, politics, but about humanity, about soul, and about spirit. And I, I, that's what I'm trying to do with Encounters. So basically, it's a film set in London, and it's a film that really kind of uh, attempts to bring to the fore uh, a London people don't see, particularly amongst the black and brown community who've been affected disproportionately more by HIV and AIDS, um, and we in London, us black and brown people in London, we come from the diaspora. We come from the subcontinent of India. We come from this global south, particularly the continent of Africa, the Caribbean, from uh, from Brazil. We come and from and from other spaces in Europe as well. You know? So we don't really get foregrounded. We don't really get centred in this conversation um, about how HIV and AIDS affects us. And I wanted to have, do a little film that kind of brought some of that together. And as well, I suppose, you know, you said that you wanted to say something personal. I, I think this is really important and it really stands out for me because the conversation around HIV AIDS, um, like the, the public narrative, um, as it relates to queer black people uh, and black people more broadly, I, I suppose, is, is definitely one of death, right? Yeah. And, 
And not much more than that. I'm really struck by how the conversation for white gay men at the minute is one that is very triumphant, right? Mm -hmm. There's this incredible success. I think the latest statistics from Public Health England suggest um, a further 18% drop in new HIV diagnoses, largely attributed to um, white gay and bi men, um, mm -hmm. you know, taking PrEP. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so there, there's a very limited space in which queer black people, queer black men in this case, show up within the HIV AIDS narrative. What is it that you want to say? Well, I want to say two or three things, um, and, and, and that's the whole point of doing an artwork, that it's not just one thing. It's a, it's a, first of all, I want to impact you visually and emotionally to think about this in a less simplistic way than a good or bad, positive, negative kind of paradigm, that people with HIV and AIDS or people with HIV are in this sort of bad category and everybody else is not, that people with HIV in some way are responsible sexually and all these kind of mythologies still persist, persist that there's something wrong. There's even words like clean and unclean that are used in, in, the, in the queer communities and, on, and outside. And there's a lot of people still who have a huge amount of shame and stigma attached to the notion of being HIV positive. And so I wanted to say something about that. And in doing that, I'm kind of celebrating the black body. I'm celebrating black sexuality and sensuality. I'm celebrating the erotic. Um, because another thing that is part of the kind of experience of being LGBTQ um, is a notion of shame around sexuality and sexual conduct. And the idea that you could, you are, you know, in, in, innately wrong to even have sexual desire, same sex sexual desire, let alone have same sexual sex you know and it sounds like you know, on a personal level that may not be the case but once you broaden that perspective into society how many times have you thought if you're uh, with your same-sex partner particularly men um whether you can you know literally hold hands in, a, in the neighborhood you're in or, or 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 you know have people over and stay depending on the kind of house that you're sharing you could be with your family or with with less less sympathetic friends or have how how have you thought about the way that your relationships play out in terms of how they are um you know um supported in society for example if you don't want to get married is your is your is your relationship even valid so it brings into focus the fact that we can enjoy pleasure, we can enjoy each other, that sexual pleasure isn't based upon just the notion of a married partner or even just a life partner. But and and the notion of sex itself related to HIV is a very, very, you know, people don't like to talk about it because it's it's kind of suggests that there's um you know there's only one way and that is to be really safe and really cautious and really but actually what I'm trying to say is that we should be imaginative. We should be, you know, really giving and loving and and kind of brave, not even brave, just kind of enjoy us at our bodies, even in the face of HIV. Yeah. I read this um I read this incredible essay by Ronaldo Walcott, I think it is, um, about I'm trying to say what I can say on, on my GWorks platform, but this basically amazing this amazing essay um, arguing for this kind of reappropriation of our desire, our erotic, what makes us happy and pleasure. And Ronaldo Walcott calls it a black jouissance, like a black pursuit of ecstasy. And that that in and of itself is kind of uh, not necessarily radical, but that we're able to, because not everything black people do has to be radical, but that this kind of drive to re-encounter the divinity of the erotic, right? That this kind of carnal bodily pleasure for um, bodies and people who have historically been so diseased, right? Or blackened or undesirable or objectified actually becomes mm -hmm. a really powerful a powerful um, moment. Megan, I want, I want to bring you in um, to ask what attracts you to um, a project like Encounters? Um, I think uh, it's twofold. I think that first and foremost, it was Topher. It was meeting Topher. It was connecting with Topher, it being in conversation with Topher and kind of, um, uh, as you said, Josh, there's kind of, there's no room for like the morbid in, in this, film there's also no room kind of for shying away or for fear and I think that I was immediately struck by kind of the the 
the intricacy of the joy and the pleasure and the sex and the um, erotic in the film. Um, and that that was just like, like Topher was coming out all guns blazing with that, um, which I just loved. Um, and also just, I think, just being in conversation with him outside of the film, I just know what's going to be brought into the film. And I know that it's going to be an incredibly like fluid changing exciting like balls to the wall process um and so that was just like thing number one um and then i think just getting more and more au fait with the project and kind of and um and seeing kind of how how it how much it can do in terms of it deals with space in such a, a kind of an amazing way in terms of like uh, intimate space and sort of uh, disenfranchised space and kind of community space and a uh, space where there's no room for stigma, HIV stigma, uh, queer stigma, you know, and um, I just, it's, I think a lot of times if you are drawn to a project, it's like, oh, I was drawn to the one thing, right? I was drawn to the, to the message or to the, to, to the texture, or to the tone, whatever. And I think that just, it, it's been an unraveling like nine month process. And just, there's so much being piled onto this film of what you can explore. And I love the, the lens through which Topher explores it. So it's Topher and then it's the kind of unraveling of this really cool film, yeah, so. I love the mention of space, right? And particularly in a year that we've been having where, <laughs> right? <laughs> that the entire, our entire understanding of what space is, how it's mediated, navigated, occupied, um, how our space, like not, not only our emotional space, but how our physical spaces have changed in really fundamental ways. And they have been changing. Um, and so I love this, this mention of, of space because it is so complex, it is so layered and, and how we move within these spaces, I think is, is a really powerful thing to explore. Definitely, I mean, one of the things that's key to me, I've always lived in cities all my life, here in New York particularly, um, and, I've, and I've ventured around the world in cities and, and as a black man, and you know, I have a particular kind of, you know, physicality, I'm six foot three, blah, 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 I have an athletic build, blah, blah, blah. So those things are, are just a given about my physicality, but I've noticed that my body, my, my inhabits, that's, you know, sends different kinds of ripples through space. <laughs> You know, by just by being in it. And it can be as simple as being followed around, you know, around a, a local Sainsbury's, Tesco's or Waitrose or whatever. Or it can be, you know, being questioned uh, in an airport or, or being followed on the street in, in Barcelona or, or being sexualized in certain kinds of ways in certain kinds of, you know, um, clubs or, or bars or whatever. Um, so you're always in relation to who you are, you're always kind of thinking, you know, what is it about being, just being here, black, being black and living, that makes people react in certain kinds of ways. And, and then there's a bigger kind of socioeconomic space, which is, you can talk about, I talk about the global south, but I talk about the way in which cities are constructed and, and segregated through rich and poor, or through, you know, black or brown and white, you know, how, how, you, how safe you feel on the streets of somewhere London, like London, if you're black, I have friends living in Chelsea who are black, who comment on the fact that, that they, they get stopped by the police an awful lot, or questioned about their, you know, permission to be in that space. I, I question the COVID thing in terms of space, you know, the fact that Section 60, which is one of the, you know, draconian laws that allows police to stop and search you without um, you know, without purpose under the COVID-20 COVID uh, 20 Act has been, you know, uh, in, imposed on Hackney, Brixton, Tottenham, those kinds of spaces. So the black, so I like to, my films are set in, in cities. My last film was in New York. I've shot in Brixton, you know, um, shot in the city of London, you know, so because I'm very interested in the built environment and black bodies and space who owns it what's permission and we've got the whole thing around gentrification and what that's done to the black communities is what it's done to the queer communities in london literally knocking down and breaking down venues so my film is an intervention in its own right it's a space for intervention in its own right for for spiritual uh, intellectual artistic you know it's intervention it's very small and that's that's on purpose because sometimes you know you can really do these things and they can be very big big, big things and they're fantastic. But the reason why it's small, it's a bit like a, it's, a, it's close to, you know, fly in the ointment type thing, you know, it stays with you. My stuff stays with you when you watch it. And also, Topher, I find that so interesting because you, 
talking there about kind of your experience of of knowing the impact that you have had in space all of your life, all of your, you know, no, being aware of the space you take up, of the space that's mm. infiltrated, of the space as a black queer artist and man, um, you've constantly been aware of how your space is policed, how you have to take it up, right? Mm. I think what's so interesting about encounters happening now is that, and you were kind of saying it, Josh, with the, with the world we currently live in, like, um, for the first time ever, the average privileged, heteronormative, cis, white, whatever it is, life, for the first time, I think, certainly in a lifetime, but, but you know, potentially ever, is being faced, even in a small way, with what it means to have your space, your personal space, your intimate space, your body space, mm -hmm. like, policed and infiltrated and judged and um, and uh, restricted, crucially restricted, I think. And you saw it in the White House and you saw it uh, at Downing Street, this kind of mm. bewilderment, bafflement, mm. and I guess like refusal, actual just like disbelief that that yeah. these lives could be conditioned in this way, that your, that your space and your, um, your body could be, um, uh, treated in this way and 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 there was a rejection of it and and i think it's so interesting basically to make a film like encounters now um i was actually listening to busy being black um josh and it was um was it bikinda bikinda kasana kasada and she uh, it was numbers game her poem bikinda kasada yes absolutely yeah. and she said um uh she in her poem it was she said something like global gags silencing separating us from ourselves um halting our movements left behind. And she was talking from like an HIV plus, but also kind of queer space uh, from, a, from a medical perspective. But actually the whole world right now feels gl like globally gagged and like yeah. and feels yeah. the mm. effects of mm. um, their space being made smaller. And I love encounters because A, even before this context, it was, it was mucking around with that anyway. And it was mucking around with space and taking taking that space into a place of erotic pleasure and joy and no stigma there but also now in the context of COVID-19 it's even more resonant I think so and I love this idea of um I really love this idea of small on purpose and it links to something I talk about all the time on the show and which regular listeners are bored of already but Kevin Kwashi's The Sovereignty of Quiet because he speaks about blackness always being presented as um Blackness is always supposed to tell you something about race or democracy or violence or resilience. And in this, in this construction, in this orientation of blackness, we lose the interiority, right? Which are these small moments, right? Which is being small on purpose, which is going into yourself, which is exploring the erotic, which is joy finding. And, and so I love that encounters is kind of, it sounds to me like it's going to uncover some of the interiority of the queer black people included or those living with HIV in the, in the film. Yeah, I mean, the thing is, sex still remains a very private thing, you know. The things that we, you know, the, the kind of, we are very careful about the kind of ways we talk about sex and talk about our sexual encounters and our erotic encounters. Um, and they are pro probably, though not, not, you know, childbirth, various other things of quite, you know, intense sort of spaces that people experience, but probably most definitely, you know, one of the most uh, intimate and most um, charged spaces we'll ever occupy. And um, yet, we never really talk about it. <laughs> it's just weird, we just don't. Um, um, because we, we are, you know, we're all kind of programmed around the respectability paradigm. And um, so we don't want to reveal our desires because our desires might be seen, be perverted. So I kind of wanted to do something which didn't, which was, which was like, you know, and also the HIV, you know, medication side of things, antiretrovirals and, and PrEP are small things, they're very small things that people take um, uh, daily. And, and, and that's that moment's over literally within a one or two seconds. So I was just very interested in that. I was just very interested in, you know, how, how do you, uh, you know, commission is a small commission anyway, but I like that because it's almost like, how do you kind of create a little peephole for which you can, you can see, see a lot more stuff than, than the actual space it takes up. So it's all about, all about that really. Yeah, and just kind of like, I like the intensity of smaller 
films because you, know, you have to pack in a lot of stuff in order for people to you know to stay with it well for me I, I think that's the case I don't I don't like boring stuff and I like also I don't, I don't I, someone asked me the other day it's like I just want to make stuff that really matters you know what I'm saying and it's not really I mean, I'm, you know I'm going to make a feature film one kind or another at some point I'm going to write a, a larger book at some point but, but this this particular moment is is I like the fact that it will be discovered somewhere on the internet after it's out and people will just want to come back to it. <laughs> I just like that. You know, I just like that. It's playful. Yeah. I love that. Um, I want to run something past you. Um, I'm reading the, um, the Calendar of Loss by Dagmali Wubshet, which kind of explores um, the cultural production of um, the queer community during the AIDS crisis and kind of examines their, their protests, their um, resilience, how they fought back against erasure. And uh, Wubshet says that, quote, works of early AIDS mourning, including both published writings and other forms of speech, such as political funerals, are steeped in what I call a poetics of compounding loss. These narratives of mourning do not recount, respond to, and reflect upon singular events of mourning but instead explicitly underscore the serial and repetitive nature of the losses they confront. And so I want to borrow from Wubshet, so I was thinking about encounters, and I want to ask if you think that encounters and indeed works like fetish could be considered a poetics of compounding erasure. Wow. <laughs> you know, it's interesting. <laughs> wow. You know, there's a, there's a thing about we arty farty filmmakers, not even arty farty, just anybody who makes work, there's a, you know, it's just something about, you know, there's that and there's how critics or, or, or thinkers like yourself then, or that, you know, the person you, you kind of quoted, then kind of, you know, frame the, the, that work, how it exists. So I can't really say that that is an intention. I, get, I, can, I, get, I can't really talk about it in that way. It's a bit like say, you know, it's a bit like when someone compliments on the, you on the way you dress, you kind of, you just dress like that because you, you like that top or that, 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 that particular outfit or whatever. You're not, you know, you're aware that you're making an effect, but there's an effect you're not even aware of. Yeah, and I guess a less pretentious way of asking that question is, like this is, this encounters go some way in challenging the erasure of Okay. And the compounded erasure of black people within an HIV narrative. Yeah. Not only in like marketing and advertising and outreach and clinical interventions, yeah. um, but also in art, right? That the mainstream art at least, right? I'm thinking of Marlon Riggs and and yeah. his yeah. incredible contribution to yeah. um, AIDS cultural production, but which isn't yeah. really considered really within a within the mainstream Ouvra, I guess. One hundred percent. You know, we are. Yeah, <laughs> it's kind of a strange thing that it doesn't matter how amazing or how interesting or how meaningful the work that we make is. We're not part of the bigger narrative. We're always a part of the marginal narrative in the way that it's it's positioned in the global north in terms of you know particularly the big English speaking countries like obviously the United States here and Canada and Australia, but throughout, you know. Um, but in terms of what we have, the conversations we have with ourselves, which is where I sit, the conversation I'm having is not with the white, you know, larger LGBT communities. My conversations, although they're welcome to that, you know, being, you know, seeing that conversation take place. It's not part of my conversation with my black and brown brothers and sisters and non-binaries and trans people. So I, I, that's kind of my exciting comment. And when I, when I travel around the world, or when I was in places like, favorite places like Brazil or the Caribbean or North America, and I've been in Africa as well, and those are the exciting conversations I have. So to some extent, yes, it does, they do, the work does speak to an erasure because it's a black person, a black queer person making the work and authoring it, you know, um, and black artists and collaborators being part of it. But that's not the only purpose. The purpose is to have a conversation with ourselves because that conversation is really lacking, really lacking. And what's, luck, what's nice about, oh, say nice, that's the wrong word. What's interesting about the dynamic of COVID and the dynamic of the BLM resurgence this year is that we are starting to talk to ourselves a lot more. Black and LGBTQ people, I'm, I myself experiencing that over the last sort of eight months. I'm actually literally talking, not that I've always had a, a groups of friends like yourself, or whatever, but, but I'm also talking to other artists, straight artists, gendered artists, and, and, and new people 
black people here and across the world. There are people gathering online in the, and part of the United States or here or in the Caribbean. There are people creating groups. So I, I think that's a really exciting place for us, which didn't exist so much before the big, um, the latest big sort of global epidemic came. Um, yeah. Megan, this is a good, a, this leads me nicely on to asking you about allyship. I think there's a really interesting conversation to have here with you about allyship. Um, how are you navigating this process of, of learning about encountering um, queer black lives, experiences so far outside of your own? And, and what's that process been like for you? It was really interesting um, because I think, uh, I think that with encounters just by a complete fluke of timeline and of uh, kind of luck of the draw, I kind of was fortunate and blessed in the fact that I became kind of an accidental ally. And what I mean there is not that I don't, that I didn't intend to become an ally. It was that in terms of timeline, me and Topher met in, in January, got on like a house on fire, got introduced kind of um, outside of this context of this year, decided to work on this film together. Um, fast forward six months, you have the surgeons of the BLM movement, you have a kind of, for the first time, um, a sort of, um, or certainly the first time I've seen, uh, and I think, I, I do think the first time, this focus on what it means to be an ally and um, and kind of literature and, and thoughts on kind of just, I, I saw just endless information and sought endless information about how you can do better and be an ally. But I was kind of fortunate that actually um, that I was already in this process having like weekly conversations with Topher um, about this film that kind of through this context seemed to be becoming more and more urgent, right? Seeing, first of all, with the pandemic kind of um, backdrop and then with everything that went on in the summer, I think that um, I yes, it, it's become a form of my expression of allyship, but but through complete fluke and default. And I'm very lucky, I think, um, that I think that the a lot of what underpins, I think, like bad allyship is like a lot of things in all of these conversations is fear, right? It's like either fear of ignorance or it's, it's fear of misspeaking. It's fear of um of the unknown it's fear of acknowledging that a system that has worked for you has failed for for others in such an aggressive way it's fear i think on a more primal level that like in order for you to give space or acknowledge space your space is somehow compromised right like it's there's there's unhealthy ideas that we can't share like or the space can't be expanded that there is one little bubble of space and that if there's room for more then your space is somehow tightened and restricted and compromised um and i think what i've learned through encounters uh and through tofer and through just again just the, the luck of the draw of the timing is kind of feel the fear and do it anyway and i don't mean be ignorant and feel the fear and do it anyway i mean do your can work but then feel that fear acknowledge that fear I think don't try and centralize that fear and turn it into like oh I guess this is similar like to when I feel like this you know um I think um I think as well like allyship not allyship but the recipient of, of an ally is is subjective right some people love to be asked questions some people want you to actually just go do the work and come to them when you're informed like there's nuance in that but we can all basically agree on some things which is like maybe just listen and also tr understand i think what empathy is empathy is not always kind of recycled um it's not I receive information, I center it around my experience, I send it back, right? It's like empathy, I think, is the pure understanding that actually you don't share an experience. Your, my experience is not shared with you on that, but I can have, I can listen, I can work and I can, I can know that and then feel that fear and, and that maybe I now have to exist somewhere that is less comfortable or less easy or, or where I have to do some work and then, and then feel the fear and do it anyway. Um, and also I think, again, I mean, I, I love this because I mean, I've just been on repeat busy being black, Josh, honestly, just like finding these incredible new people and just like, it's just, I, I mean, yeah, anyway, we'll, we'll talk after, but, um, but it was the, I think I was listening to the, um, the episode, my brain's just, I've got too many things basically. I've got one that was the, the, um, the episode with um, Charity So White. Mm. And mm. 
I can't remember which of the two co-founders it was, but they said like, we're not talking about just safe space, we're talking about brave space. Um, and like, again, with all of our conversations around space, I feel like what I'm enjoying about, about all of this, uh, of the process of allyship with Topher is there, like, like, there is no room for fear um, or safety in Topher's work. Brave is a bit of a naff word, but if we're going to go like safe or brave, it's it's brave, right? it's bold, it's unapologetic, it's in places confrontational, it's challenging, but it's also experimental and playful and joyous. And so I think mottos of allyship for this year, feel the fear and do it anyway, and uh, take up a brave space after doing your fucking work. <laughs> yes, do the work. I think it's really important. <laughs> you know, my G work is, is full of people um, who are looking to be allies, right? And who are looking to show solidarity and who might not necessarily always feel the fear and do it anyway. Topher, do you think that encounters will help in some way for people to understand more about how they can show up for others? Yeah, I think definitely um, it's going to be... Uh, I think for some people, they'll see either themselves or their experience, emotionally speaking, because it's about the emotional impacts, really, not, not the factual impact of the film. It's not a, it's not a documentary. Um, but also for some people, it'll be a signpost. It'll be like a pointer towards something that they haven't seen or don't know about, which they will then clickety-clack, clackety-clack, and googly google then way their way too, you know, and that's that's also important as well. And then that's not that's not that's nothing to do with sexuality or race. That's that's just a sort of a general kind of reaction you'll you'll get. I mean, just by virtue of the, it's interesting. The confidence I have comes from working in this medium for quite a long time. And my last film, Fetish, which came from a very simple um, uh, point of uh, trying to find a space that would uh, would 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 uh, open up our understanding of, of the emotional journey that certain people will experience, particularly black men, but it didn't, that was my thing. But when, I took, when I've shown it globally, I've shown it to groups of trans people, to straight, it's obviously been in front of straight white people, it's been in front of a straight black men and women, it's been in front of a lot of people. And yeah, it's been amazing that, the, the, that everyone sees themselves. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm saying? That was that was a real surprise. I didn't. I didn't. So, so. Well, and I think if I may, with, with fetish, there was that. I mean, you're literally walking through New York naked, and that is lots of people's worst nightmare, right? And I think that that vulnerability of fetish, uh, I think, is really powerful, right? It's it's a universal. And that, that, to go back to Megan's, Megan's point about brave spaces, that's, that's brave, that's courageous. That, is, that, that level of vulnerability takes a tremendous amount of courage. And I think- That's the interesting thing. I mean, and this is me not trying to be, it's not interesting, I'm not interested in my particular um, uh, authority in this, but the world that we live in has to have spaces where we confront truth as opposed to the paradigm of propaganda and, Poor propaganda is everything else. So you need to be this kind of person. You need to experience these kinds of things in order to be a good or bad person. You need to experience this kind of life in order to have happiness. You need to experience this kind of, um, you know, um, uh, physical, you know, material, or other kind of sensation in order to be a human being. Uh, I, don't, I don't, I don't take that on board. I think that's very different. I think, I think the spaces that that black queer men particularly exist in, and some and black queer women and lots of black trans people exist in, are not spaces that are always comfortable. They're not always spaces that are that have any light shed on them. They're certainly not always respectable spaces. Um, and I wanted to say that that kind of that kind of space is as valid as the space that's flattened out by the white middle classes in suburbia. You know, there's no truth that is hierarchical. You know, those things exist, but this exists too. And so it's also about those sort of, those sort of things. So I don't like Megan, I'm glad, glad you were saying, I don't use the word brave. I hear that said about my work and about who I am. And I'm glad you pointed that out. It's about, it's about a discovery uh, of the ability to play with and not play with, to, to kind of really kind of con, con, have a conversation with some of the things that really motivate us. <laughs> Sexual desire 
and fear are two things that really motivate us. They're well, I'm glad you said that. Yeah. Because we're almost out of time, but I have yeah. to ask, I have to, I, we gotta, we gotta go back to the erotic. Yeah. Um, me, king of finding quotes, found a beautiful quote from Audre Lorde. The erotic is a measure between the beginnings of our sense of self and the chaos of our strongest feelings. It is an internal sense of satisfaction to which once we have experienced it, we know we can aspire. For having experienced the fullness of this depth of feeling, the erotic, and recognizing its power in honor and self-respect, we can require no less of ourselves. Nice. Right? Well, like this encounter with the erotic, this exploration of the erotic, its power, its energy, its information. Once we've been to that place, we'll always take ourselves there. We respect it. We treat it with reverence. And, and, I also, don't... and also the LGBT, okay, I'm saying LGBTQ, but lesbians, gay or queer and bisexual men, trans men and women, and, and straight identified men and women. Sex teaches us who we are. We get a huge amount of its absence or its, or its participation. It teaches us who we are. That's why Audrey's thing is so powerful. And because we discover who we are. And also, you know, when I was younger, and you, you experienced as well, Josh, you know, the idea of finding friends, finding lifelong friends through sexual encounters uh, is, you know, it's, it's, it's almost like a survival kind of like, you know, mechanism for, 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 for gay identified or bisexual identified people. So, yeah. But do, and do we ever see HIV plus in a truly erotic space do we ever see it do we ever witness it is do we and i mean in art i mean in film i mean you know like do like i can't think of a time when unless it's been shrouded in the erotic began the death sentence came shrouded in shame and stigma i cannot think of a time i've seen it I've seen actual pleasure and erotica and freedom of sex explored with an HIV plus kind of um, diagnosis. With or, a black, particularly, because I think there is a lot of white um, HIV positive people for whom that is a, they've seen that version of themselves, right? The one that gets to enjoy sex now again, now that they're, um, you know, undetectable or what have you. Um, so thank you for Thank you for that. I think that's a wonderful contribution. So um, to end, I normally ask all of my guests, what do you hope for? But in this case, I think the hope is the support of the MyG Work community. I'm going to put that in your mouth. And so let's be explicit about how the MyG Work community can support encounters. Okay. Yeah. Um, so we are at about to embark on our fundraising for the film. So as Topher said, um, the, the charity is Small But Mighty Visual Aids. They're incredible. They do amazing work around the day without art, but they're small. The commission um, is kind of in support and small value only. Um, we are about to start fundraising and what that will eventually do will allow us to pay all of our, and it will be an all black, all brown, all LGBTQIA plus cast and crew um and that is not a kind of like it's a, it's not a token it's commitment like that is that is the spec um it will pay for our locations uh we have an eventual aim to film on realton road in brixton uh, as part of the film um to kind of sort of salivate that site of kind of freedom and activism we uh will need to cater the set we will need to um to ensure the set and make sure everyone's safe particularly with, a, with if we're filming still in a covid19 context um we will need to market the film and get it out there you know we're very lucky that because of our link with visual aids very exciting we will be in new york this time next year for for world aids day on december 1st screening the film for the first time but there is a lot of work to go in before that um, we are shooting early next year uh, and, and across summer so that we have the kind of vibrancy of, of the summer um, to underpin the joy uh, and the freedom of, of Topher's film. So we need uh, anything, anything small. And the beauty with something like my G work, which is such an incredibly 
wide network is we we don't need a lot if every single person on that network contributed a pound like we're set you know and and then some so um if you if you have a minute and 50p or a pound or whatever you know um or more and if you'd like to also if you'd like to be more involved in the film um chat to us we'll 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 put our our um our website and our email and stuff out there if you'd like to be involved in a different way but fundraising is our current thing and that is how people can help is just to donate uh, and we'll give a link um donate small and we can deliver big hopefully <laughs> so can i say so i yeah. think um by helping us make this film you help us fight stigma against hiv globally. thank you thank you to topher and megan for this wonderful conversation i'm so pleased all the places that it went and thank you all for joining us for this conversation topher and megan are raising money to create encounters a film exploring hiv aids intimacy belonging and the erotic and queer communities of color for those with the means please consider donating thank you to my g work for facilitating this conversation and to all of you for tuning in